Thanks, Nick, for the introduction. I've already had some really interesting conversations, so it's going to be really, really great to get your feedback today on these presentations and just get your thoughts in general on testing. We still in the water industry do test for indicator organisms such as E. coli, total coliforms, enterococci. Um, but we're moving more towards direct detection of waterborne pathogens, particularly in certain scenarios where that's becoming more and more important. Um, I won't go through this too much, but I'm going to discuss uh, Pseudomonas and uh, the detection of Pseudomonas uh, globally. And then also Legionella. And right at the end, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, a new product offering from uh, IDEX, but the, you know, this is not a sales and marketing pitch, it's really an open discussion about the detection of, of waterborne pathogens. So Pseudomonas is a genus of bacteria, it's pretty, pretty large, and we know members, uh, species of that genus, which cause infection. But even though all uh, of the species of this genus can cause infection, we tend to focus uh, on the detection of Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and that's because it's that particular species or group of bacteria which tends to cause the worst infections. Um, Pseudomonas aeruginosa is a ubiquitous contaminant of water systems. You'll find it pretty much everywhere. And having that bacterium in your water system has various... Uh, consequences. For your general domestic environment or bottled water, you're just, just going to get taste and odour problems. So the, the smelly dishcloth that you find a week after you've come back from holiday, that's typically going to be pseudomonas. It's not a big deal. It's pretty easy to get rid of. Uh, and then when you get to pool water and spa waters, then you can start to get um, some different infections such as swimmer's ear or hot tub rash. Uh, they're not pleasant for the individual, but they're, they're generally not going to kill anybody. Um, the thing is when we get into certain situations, such as in the healthcare sector, so Pseudomonas aeruginosa tends to associate itself pretty tightly with biofilm. Um, that biofilm gives it an environment where it can survive water treatment and it can persist within uh, a water distribution network quite happily. Uh, and obviously because it can associate with biofilm anywhere you've got tubing, particularly involving uh, a moist background, moist environment, you can get potentially life-threatening infections. So in those scenarios, it's quite important to look specifically for this pathogen. So again, we covered primarily taste and odour problems with bottled water. Bottled water companies are going to be doing batch monitoring for between 100 and 250 mils of water from that batch. Uh, and they, again, they, they really want to see zero in that before they release that batch. Then in your pools and spas, they'll be doing monthly monitoring. Obviously, these are generalized um, situations. There's going to be specific areas, specific countries, specific sectors where they might do more testing or less testing. But again, their limits, they want to see zero per 100 mils. And in these situations, a lot of things are controlled by trying to control the chemistries for the water treatment. So the correct level of chlorine or bromine, the correct pHs. It doesn't always work, but that's the way they try and uh, uh, protect against infection. So when we get to you know, the healthcare setting, where you're going to get at-risk groups coming into contact with these bacteria, where we really have to... Uh, concentrate more on looking directly for that pathogen and you know the limits of detection the limits are, uh, allowed in these water sources are very much dependent on the source sadly even though we do our best to try and eradicate pseudomonas aeruginosa from uh, situations where risk patients are coming into contact with it we still do have that occurring and there have been cases where we've had um, you know, sadly, at-risk groups uh, having fatal infections, neonatal deaths from the presence of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So it is important for us to look specifically for this pathogen. In terms of sampling locations, it varies very much. So 
In general, we're looking at circulated hot and cold water systems. We try and maintain those water systems within the correct range of temperatures uh, and look at pseudomonas aeruginosa per 100 mils. In uh, dialysis, obviously, we're using that those pieces of equipment with patients, but then they have to be cleaned and decontaminated, and we want to check that there's no aeruginosa around, so we're not putting future patients at risk from this bacterium. Spa pools, hydrotherapy pools, where uh, we're trying to give people therapy to help them recuperate from a particular incident. Uh, it's very important for us to monitor those. We follow pool water treatment advisory group guidelines on this. And then in dental settings and really in augmented care units, uh, where we're going to get the high risk people coming into contact with water. That's when we really, really want to focus. This is just an example of a water testing regime. Um, so we would do routine monitoring of the water and then depending on whether we do not detect or we detect at various levels, that dictates our response. Uh, this is a generalised response for the UK. The Health and Safety Executive prescribed this, uh, but it just gives you an example of what we look at. You're currently doing similar things over here, so this is a draft guideline. Um, it applies to the sterilisation of a lot of instrumentation used in the healthcare setting. And this is a table that's specific for thermolabile endoscopes. I think we mentioned that just previously. Um, so for Pseudomonas aeruginosa, obviously we do not want to detect any aeruginosa once we've sterilised that product, for obvious reasons. In terms of testing, there are variations on a the theme. There's the, the, the general ISO standard um, using PACN agar. Uh, there's a lot of nasty chemicals involved in confirmations with that standard ISO procedure. Uh, so there are a lot of variations of this media where we're using chromogenic substrates to help us to detect Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And then there is now a second ISO standard, which is Pseudalert. Um, you can use this either in a presence-absence format. Uh, you just simply add your reagent, let it dissolve and incubate. Or you can do a quantitative analysis, should you wish, whereby you would add this to a quantitation device, incubate it and generate your MPN result. The Pseudalert works on an enzymatic basis. So we have a specific substrate and we look for a specific enzyme present in Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And the enzyme turns over that substrate, produces a product which fluoresces under UV light. Very, very simple 